Great. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the American Library in Paris's virtual evenings with an author program with Samuel Ziffy. I'm Catherine Olin, programs manager at the American Library. For those of you who are just discovering us, we're the largest English language lending library on the European continent. And we have a, a new expansion that has just opened up too for so if anybody is going to visit in person, which you still can do for the time being, you'll see that we have a lovely new addition to our children's and teens section. So beyond being a space for books, we are also a vibrant cultural center and event space. For the time being, we're of course meeting on Zoom to stay safe, but be sure to look out for all of the types of events that we author, offer um, on our website. We offer everything for, from the smallest children to adults. Uh, we have writing workshops, just a, a variety of wonderful programs for readers and writers alike. Um, we're also an independent nonprofit, so we don't receive support from either the French or American governments, but rather we rely on the generosity of our donors and library members as well. So thank you to those of you in the audience who may be supporters in some form or another. And a big warm welcome, of course, to those of you who are just discovering us. We are just as happy that you're here as well, and we hope you continue to come to programs. Uh, you can learn more about us on our homepage and on a variety of social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and as I mentioned, we do have a YouTube channel where you can browse past programs. All right, tonight, tonight I am delighted to be hosting Samuel Zip. He is a cultural and intellectual historian at Brown University. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Plus One, The Baffler, and The Nation, and is the author of Manhattan Projects, The Rise and Fall of Urban Renewal in Cold War New York. He also co-edited a collection of the writings of Jane Jacobs. Tonight, he'll be speaking to us about his latest book, The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's wartime quest to build one world. I kind of had to pause before I say that. You know, you've got a lot of W's going on. It's the alliteration is these, wonderful. Yep, it's all <laughs> that with that subtitle. In any case, so Dr. Samuel Ziff has kindly offered to allow us to call him Sandy. So I will, I will take you up on that and a warm welcome to you, Sandy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thanks to everybody for, for joining us to the, this evening where you are this afternoon where I am here in Providence, Rhode Island. So I'm really happy to, to be here with you and to be able to join you. Uh, one of the, the rare benefits of our current global condition uh, is to be able to do events like this easily and with, uh, with little trouble, although I wish I could have joined you, of course, in, in Paris, who wouldn't? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and I'm gonna be um, speaking about some things that I learned in researching and writing my new book, The Idealist about Wendell Wilkie. So let me um, share screen and also turn off my email so it doesn't keep beeping. Sorry about that. And I will share screen and um, we'll get started. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm going to um, talk a little about uh, what's going on in the book, some of the ideas in the book. Um, and then I think at the end, I'll read a little bit from uh, the part in the book where Wilkie encounters um, Charles de Gaulle. Um, and this happens in, in, uh, in Beirut uh, in 1942. And I'll give you the context for that when we get to that part. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, what I'm gonna be talking about today world is sort of worldwide thinking. Well, Wendell Wilkie and the idea of one world. Um, and what I'm trying to do is um, to give everybody a sense that the story of Wendell Wilkie's world travels during World War II, there's all those, all those W's again. You all don't wanna know the struggles I had trying to come up with a uh, subtitle for this book. Uh, along with his best-selling book, One World of 1943, and his capacious, if yes, idealistic vision of world cooperation, how that all might be of some use to all of us during our own times of global crisis. This is in many ways a lost history, or we might say a partially obscured history, um, obscured in two ways. First, I think it's hidden behind a conventional story of Wendell Wilkie's significance when he is remembered at all as a public figure. So often when we recall Wilkie today, we're most likely to think of him as the losing candidate in the 1940 election to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of course, and to think of the political events of 1940 and 1941 in the United States as the country was struggling to decide whether or not it should enter World War II, right? The, the months before Pearl Harbor and the decision was essentially made for the United States. Um, Wilkie is thought of as one of the most famous also-rans in United States history, somebody who came close to winning the presidency, um, but did not. 
Um, and then thought of those, those events in 1940 and 41 when he worked with Roosevelt in a kind of uh, team of rivals model of political leadership, you know, cross party lines, Democratic, um, Democratic FDR, the Republican Wendell Wilkie, although Wilkie had, uh, and you can read more about this in my book, had long been a Democrat himself and switched parties in order to take advantage of the possibility of running as a Republican against the isolationist, so-called isolationist wing of the Republican Party. Um, and the story uh, around these events goes that um, what Wilkie did was give a service to the United States, a service to the nation to help take the US into World War II and in so doing prepare the way for the fabled and now threatened liberal world order established by the rise of US global dominance during and just after World War II. Um, I want to suggest, though, in this book I, I wrote to try to, to uh, as I worked in the archives around this and thought about Wilkie as a sort of neglected um, historical figure, both in US and global history, I want to suggest that this is not his most important legacy um, and that it, in fact, gets Wilkie's ideas about the US role in the world wrong. Um, thinking of this conventional story as the most important story surrounding Wilkie has led to the sort of second act of occlusion here the forgetting of his most useful and resonant legacy, or maybe the misremembering of his most resonant legacy, which is the flawed and much maligned, but I think still useful idea of one world, right? And it's particularly, I think, useful again to us today. And I'll return to that in a second. So what I'd like to do is to, is today is to talk about where the idea of one world came from and to give you a picture of a time when the idea of one world had a particular political and ethical connotation the use of it identified someone as taking a particular stance in the unfolding debates around global politics and social relations in the middle of the century, particularly in the period between 1941 and 42 and say 1946 and 47 or even into 48 as the um, in the years before the Cold War really erased this um, or as this legacy. So I'd like to think of us, uh, I'd like for us to think of one world as a kind of usable past not as a universally um, applicable ideal outside of time, but as an idea from one time of global crisis um, that has re uh, renewed power, I think, to expand our imaginations in our own time of global crisis. I wanna try to show you how Wilkie's journey, his book and the idea of one world represented or symbolized some of the dilemmas of what we today offhandedly call globalization and did so three quarters of a century ago. So. The phrase one world comes from, as I've suggested, the title of Wilkie's 1943 bestseller. Um, he wasn't the first to use the term. Many internationalists with similar ideas had used it in one way or another, but it was the vast popularity and visibility that he attracted during the war, a sort of quasi celebrity that he enjoyed during World War II that gave the term the power to signify a whole worldview. And in many ways, what this book uh, one of the threads running through this book is the attempt to try to reveal the larger cultural history of this celebrity that Wilkie attained, how Wilkie's political fame arose at the heart of what I call the age of broadcasting, um, a time when media technology had reached its peak moment of mass production and consumption. So this is the age of the radio networks, the news wires and syndication services, the newsreels, the weekly picture magazines, right, a, a time that many of you are probably familiar with, remember, right, which is not so long gone, but which was uh, at its peak at this time, all of which assembled the greatest collective audience for news and information in human history, a time before the media fragmentation that would be unleashed in the wake of the television revolution of the 1950s and 60s. So what was this one world vision? Wilkie announced it in the opening moments of the book in this quote that I have here on the screen. There are no distant points in the world any longer, he wrote, the airplane and a global war had combined, he argued, not only to shrink space, but also to push Americans towards a new understanding of their nation's political responsibilities. All the world's peoples were being drawn closer together, he said, while the United States in particular was now inescapably enmeshed with the rest of the world. Our thinking in the future, he declared, must be worldwide. Now these inserts, insights were the product of a journey that Wilkie took around the world in the late summer of 1942 to visit the battlefronts of the war. Carrying messages to allied leaders from his former rival, President Franklin Roosevelt, Wilkie flew 31,000 miles in 49 days, making stops in the Middle East, the Soviet Union, and China. Upon his return to New York, 
36 million people tuned in to hear his report to the people broadcast over all the radio networks. One World, which reached about 4 million readers in all total, gave readers an account of that trip the next year and was the culminating act in Wilkie's rise to become a kind of popular icon of global idealism during these years. Here's Wilkie delivering the report to the people in October of 1942. So I tell the full story of that trip in The Idealists and here in, in, in the second part of my talk here, I'll give you a, just a little sliver from of that story. Um, but I talk about his stops across Africa, the Middle East, Russia and Asia, in Nigeria, Sudan, Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, the Soviet Union and China and the people he met in Cairo, in Ankara, in Beirut, in Jerusalem, in Baghdad, in Tehran, Moscow and Chongqing. From Charles de Gaulle, to Joseph Stalin, to Chiang Kai-shek, and to a host of other leaders and ordinary people in between. And the book gives you a sense of what he encountered there, the many different scenes he found himself in and the ways that he tried to handle um, and figure out how to handle what was happening in the world, right? A world of insurgent peoples whose desires for freedom did not make it into the headlines and newsreels carrying war news across the globe, or at least not to the degree that the main story of the war in Europe and the war unfolding in the Pacific did. He essentially discovered a planet poised between two great world ordering forces, the European empires, British, French, Dutch, that had shaped the globe since the 19th century and before, and the new rising power of the United States, which was struggling with itself to figure out how it would greet, understand, and interact with the world it was poised to dominate in the years after the war. But One World was written not so much uh, with these audiences that he encountered around the world in mind, but with Americans in mind, for Americans, to try to get them to actually confront the world as it was, right? to bring home messages from the world at large, um, to try to expand Americans' view and vision of what was going on outside the boundaries of their, their nation. The most important thing for Americans to understand about the world, Wilkie believed, was that it was becoming one, as he said, right? seems sort of obvious, but it meant a number of different things in this period, right? He said there were no distant points in the world. This was a new geopolitical and emotional reality that Americans had yet to really see and understand. The, the, the power of air, um, airplanes and air flight and the, the transformed uh, sort of sensory and emotional and moral experience of a global war had made people feel that they were all interconnected in a way that had not been the case before, particularly after years of global economic deceleration during the Great Depression, which had made people feel more isolated. In a speech in 1943, not long after the book came out, he said, quote, we can stop thinking of the world today as a geographical map, splotches of color that stand only for nations and national possessions. And we can begin to think of the human beings who live within those splotches of color as living also within a larger map that marks a single world. One World, the book, featured a map of this transnational single world called uh, The Flight of the Gulliver, shown here. Um, it did away with the borders uh, uh, between nations and those splotches of color that signified national collectivity. It showed instead a great blue-green spread of ocean and continents collected, uh, connected only by the vector of Wilkie's voyage. And you can see here all the points he touched down in the world that I mentioned earlier before. For him, this new universal world space offered a kind of clear political lesson. The peace, he said, um, the peace after the war must be planned on a world basis making real the full global interdependency that he hoped would push Americans to avoid the two threats to future world peace, isolationism on the one hand and empire on the other, both of which were underpinned by what he called, quote, narrow nationalism. However, Wilkie brought something else home to Americans as well, another aspect of this um, one world vision. The flight of the Gulliver image you see here depicted not only the single world, but also a new kind of world geography. The world was not only becoming one, Wilkie argued, it was being reshaped politically. Perhaps the most significant fact in the world today, he wrote, is the awakening that is going on in the East. This realization pushed him to challenge Americans to see the demands of the world's colonized peoples. He was, as he wrote in the closing moments of World War of One World, quote, only passing on an invitation which the peoples of the East have given us. Here, Wilkie is addressing a crowd in Chongqing, China's wartime capital. And from the Middle East to China, 
uh, lands under various degrees of current or historic sway to European powers, Wilkie made himself into a vehicle, a kind of medium, we might say, not only for the idea of a unified world, but also for the widespread demand uh, that the freedom for which the allies fought should be extended unilaterally and without regard for colonialism. Men and women all over the world, he wrote in One World, are on the march, physically, intellectually, and spiritually. Old fears no longer frighten them. They are no longer willing to be Eastern slaves for Western prophets. The big house on the hill surrounded by mud huts has lost its awesome charm, he said. For people everywhere, he said, in Africa, in the Middle East, throughout the Arab world, as well as in China and the whole Far East, freedom means the orderly but scheduled abolition of the colonial system, unquote. But Wilkie didn't actually stop there. He issued a challenge to Americans as well, all right? He's saying, Americans have to find a way to uh, force Europeans to realize that the colonial system is over, right? Even in, during the middle of World War II, there were many signs that many of the European powers were not willing to give up their empires, even though that would um, proceed within 10 or 15 to 20 years after World War II. During the war, this was still a very fraught issue. But he also issued a challenge to Americans, right? He said, the moral atmosphere in which the white race lives is changing, he wrote late in One World. It is changing not only in our attitude toward the people of the Far East, it is changing here at home. The United States, he charged, had long, quote, practiced inside our boundaries, something that amounts to race imperialism. So what Wilkie tried to talk about was what he called our imperialisms at home. And he had long had um, relationships with uh, American campaigners for, um, for civil rights. Um, for instance, this is a poster that, um, that advertises his civil rights stands uh, during the 1940 campaign, right? Um, and the support that he had um, from African-American uh, groups, right? He was involved with the NAACP, a close friend of Walter White, the head of the NAACP. Um, and his progressive views had earned him the support of many African-Americans in the 1940 election, right? And for many ways, he was able to peel away some support from, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who wasn't willing to go as far as Wilkie was, particularly in the issue that Wilkie highlights at the bottom of this flyer, uh, the issue of lynching, right? Wilkie, uh, Roosevelt was, was really hamstrung by his Southern Democratic supporters in Congress, of course, who were committed to Jim Crow and would never support an anti-lynching bill. Wilkie is a Republican and um, needing no and, and expecting no support from the Southern uh, bloc of Democrats uh, in, in, had, no, had no need to, to um, and believed in an end to uh, lynching and an anti-lynching bill. So he could run on that. And he got much as many support from African-Americans. But it was his trip, I think, that really allowed him to see how American ideals of freedom were at stake and how they could be found wanting. During a war against fascism and militarism, when colonized peoples were making their freedom dreams known, the United States had to look at its own inequities as well. He wrote, it is becoming increasingly apparent to thoughtful Americans that we cannot fight the forces of, uh, and ideas of imperialism abroad and maintain any form of imperialism at home. The war has done this to our thinking. And I think Wilkie was sort of almost alone in these years, with the exception perhaps of Eleanor Roosevelt, as a mainstream white political figure with the cultural reach to access literally millions of American homes in labeling domestic segregation as akin to colonialism, colonialism as a kind of imperialism at home. Um, and this is, I think, one of the forgotten roles that he played during the war, uh, sort of overshadowed and lost in our, in our histories of World War II. Overall, Wilkie argued the fate of the United States uh, rested on challenges that were both within and beyond the nation's borders. Americans had to embrace a sense of reciprocity with the world. Their power in independence in the post-war world, Wilkie argued, would require embracing interdependence with others. Interdependence with the world was in turn dependent on the independence of subject peoples, both at home and abroad. And so American independence, right, its freedom to act in the post-war world required it to work to end colonialism and racism, both at home and abroad. As he put it, the way to make certain that we do recover our traditional American way of life with a rising standard of living for all, this is what he said in his Chung King speech, quote, is to create a world in which all men everywhere can be free. 
So Wilkie's newly interdependent world, his shrinking world, was intended to call into question rather than reaffirm unquestioned assumptions about American or even Western dominance in the world. The lack of capacity for self-governance in the colonized world or the hierarchies of race undergirding those assumptions. The United States, he argued, was enmeshed in a larger world in which its power and its future power relied on its efforts to advance the freedom of the peoples of the globe not just the United States' promise that it abstractly stood for that freedom around the world. Now, Wilkie wasn't perfect. He challenged Americans, but he was also not immune to the idea that Americans could fix the world, an illusion that has had, I think, devastating or at least un, um, unwelcome effects for many years since World War II, right up to our own time. His worldview depended in many ways on the centrality of, of the United States. In fact, he thought that one of the things that bound all people together in the new one world was fondness for the United States. Chief amongst these ideas, quote, which millions and millions of men hold in common, he wrote, was the mixture of respect and hope with which the world looks to this country. The United States, he reported, enjoyed an unprecedented reservoir of goodwill out in the world. Now, there's quite a bit more, more to be said about this. There's quite uh, more in the book. But in the interest of time, I just want to note the way that Wilkie's adoption of the trope of goodwill ran somewhat counter to the sense that he otherwise gave of a world rising up to demand and win its freedom from empire. If, as he said, he intended to bring back to the United States an invitation which the peoples of the East have given us, the logic of goodwill appeared to cut in a slightly different kind of direction. By that measure, the United States sat at the heart of the world's expectations. The opportunity and power lay not with those levying demands for freedom, but with Americans, whose store of goodwill was the measure of their benign intentions. The very rhetoric of goodwill that Wilkie deployed suggested that the interdependence he sought could be guaranteed only by the presence and power of the United States to protect it. So in that sense, then, uh, by those lights, the flight of the Gulliver, Gulliver looks less like a map of American, or sorry, of an interdependent world than a map of American world influence. And, re and it really reveals um, the way that Wilkie also was uh, indebted to an idea of Americans, uh, American benevolence and its benevolent sway over a unified globe that nonetheless, in many ways, occludes the very presence of American power um, and the history of American empire itself in certain parts of the globe. So what I've hoped to do here is to give you a sense of how Wilkie embodied the dilemmas of global citizenship, right? And particularly for an American um, at the middle, in the middle of the 20th century, at this just at this sort of hinge moment in the 20th century um, during World War II, uh, between these two sort of world ordering ideas, European empire and American power on the other hand. So Wilkie popularized the idea of one world, an anti-racist view of the world that hoped to create a more democratic shape for future world order. This vision was attacked as naive and impotent in the face of post-war politics. And, and that's in part true, I think. But I, I think our conventional histories of World War II and its aftermath tend to underplay the fact uh, that Wilkie's one world idea was also a strategic vision, one that was broadly popular for a time on the liberal left. He argued that cooperation with the Soviet Union was necessary to avoid a new global conflict and that agreement between the US and the USSR would allow the world to move towards the end of the great scourge of the more modern world order, racialized empire, and thus give smaller countries a greater role on the world stage and an opportunity uh, for freedom and equitable economic development. Now in the book, you can read about how that vision fared during the founding of the United Nations and the coming of the Cold War. Um, and as you may guess, my book is ultimately a history of failure. Um, and these, I believe, histories of failure are always the most interesting kinds of stories of histories because they allow us to imagine what has been left undone for our own times. Indeed, what I hope to share with you today is how Wilkie's vision reflected not only the ambivalent and charged dilemmas of his own moment, but of the globalized times we all live in today. So as I try to show in the conclusion of my book, Wilkie's ideas predicted our own times. Like other internationalists, he suggested the way that some kind of widely shared ethos of global connection that went beyond the formal governance and even cooperation of nation states would be necessary uh, to handle the increasingly global challenges of modern life. Um, he also showed how the recalcitrant current of nationalism, right, that he was also um, indebted to, was, would hold on, right, and suggested how hard it would be to, to, to shed that and how hard it would be to achieve a truly interconnected um, global form of governance. Something I'm sure all of you 
are quite familiar with, particularly in this time of global pandemic, the brutal effects of which have been accelerated, particularly here in this country, in the United States, uh, by a sense that the US can and should just go it alone. So uh, what I hope to suggest is that, that Wilkie gives us some resources for thinking about why we might want to recover some of the aspects of thinking in terms of one world um, for our own times of global interconnection and for a, a period in which we have tended to um, accept some of the benefits of globalization, particularly in the United States, um, but to slough off some of its responsibilities and to, to go back again to these ideas uh, to try to to re-up our sense of, of what our responsibilities to each other around the world in, a, in, a, in this small world really are, um, without uh, particularly putting my finger on the scale of one or the other, but to, to, to recall Wilkie as an inspirational figure for that, that work, that undertaking that I think we're all gonna need to be um, engaged in in the years ahead um, if we're to survive, I think. Um, we find ourselves in a period in which I think that's all been pressed home upon us. So I'll stop there with that part. And maybe um, while people are gathering their questions or their thoughts, I will um, just read a little bit uh, quickly from the book. Is that good, Catherine? What time is it here? No, that's perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation, Sandy. That sounds that yeah. sounds great. Do you want to go yeah. ahead and close out the PowerPoint maybe while you um, right. while you do the reading as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, and just to formally invite everybody, um, we are now taking questions. So Sandy's going to do a reading for us. That'll take a couple of minutes. And in the meantime, please feel free to type out and prepare your questions and send those in the chat feature and we'll get through as many as time allows. All right, thank you. Great. Um, so uh, this, this passage is from uh, a, a chapter called The Imperial Dilemma. It's chapter five in the book, and it's about, um, it, it's about Wilkie's visit to Syria and Lebanon. Well, pre really much, pretty much to Beirut. Um, he didn't go much beyond Beirut, but it's part of his arc through the Middle East. He stopped in Beirut, which was at that time um, essentially under the control of, of, of the French through the mandate system um, that was established after World War I. Um, and I won't go into too many details about that, but he found himself in the middle of a, of, of a kind of, not only the politics of World War II, but the politics of, uh, jostling politics of, of Syrian and Lebanese nationalism, as there were a, a group of, uh, many group of groups of um, insurgent uh, forces trying to liberate this country, um, the country of Syria and Lebanon. Um, some of them saw this as one whole unit, one whole unity, others saw them as different countries, right, from French, um, rule. And there were also British soldiers on the ground at this point in Syria and Lebanon as part of the war effort too. So it's a very complex situation. But what I wanted to read today, which I think is amusing and, and interesting and, and give you a flavor of some of the other things that happened in this book, um, is just the, the many, the stories of the, uh, the people that he um, encounters along the way in his, in his trip. Um, so I'm going to talk a little, I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, his meeting with de Gaulle. Um, and then some things that happen after that, that um, was a sort of interesting road not taken in, um, in French politics. And this features um, both Wilkie and one of his um, traveling companions, a, a journalist by the name of um, Gardner uh, Mike Cowles, who was a publisher and journalist who was along with, with Wilkie for the trip. Wilkie's meeting with de Gaulle that evening, just after his discussion with Syrian and, and Lebanese leaders, made the French position on empire clear. Wilkie probed the general for hints that he might be receptive to independence, but the free French leader, tall and haughty in his white officer's linens, lived up to his reputation as prickly un and unyielding. Any concession on his part would mean ceding advantage to the British. He could not, quote, sacrifice or compromise his principles, he said. Wilkie pushed a bit more. Would the French end the mandate? De Gaulle stood firm. In no place in this world can I yield a single French right, Wilkie remembered him saying. And as they all stood up to go into a banquet dinner, the general laid his hand on a bust of Joan of Arc and declared, she saved France, I will save France. Good day, gentlemen, and left the room. Now, the meeting might be seen as a minor spat between competing wartime allies, and de Gaulle would later complain that Wilkie was a little different from other Americans. Right? They all indulged in the, quote, standard malevolent banter and seemed to think that he had a Joan of Arc or Louis XIV complex. Of course, that judgment wasn't so far-fetched, given that the diffident and proud de Gaulle, de Gaulle had been known to directly compare his place in history to just that, to that of just such illustrious savers of the French nation. 
Wilkie and, and Cowles, the Gardner Cowles, seem to have at least partially embraced the idea, common among American officials from FDR on down, that de Gaulle was little more than a self-aggrandizing troublemaker. Looking on from afar, irked by de Gaulle's demeanor, they could not appreciate the depth of his predicament or the strength of will it took to be in exile, fighting for his country with a death sentence on his head. Now, grandstanding aside, the exchange helped Wilkie to see how crucial French imperial rights were to the restoration of the French nation. Empire motivated almost everything. The free French military effort in the region, pre-war promises to the League of Nations, cynical dealings with the Lebanese and Syrians. De Gaulle would accuse Wilkie of having arrived at the meeting with no experience in the Middle East and his mind made up. He wasn't wrong, but the larger truth was less comforting to his ego. The French leader simply did not like what Wilkie was learning. Later, he would say that Wilkie had left convinced that, quote, the friction in Beirut was merely an episode in the rivalry between two equally detestable colonial systems. Indeed, this was part of the lesson, lesson that Wilkie took home, that France's mission civilisatrice, excuse me, I butchered that, left little room for Lebanese and Syrian dreams of freedom, along with a sense that the two semi-colonial peoples were moving closer together drawn to each other by their shared interest in self-determination. The traveler's sense that Lebanon and Syria had become elaborate stage sets for great power wrangling took on a particularly foul air at the banquet that night. Years later, Cowles would remember that he was nearly pulled into a little bit of intrigue right out of an Eric Ambler novel. Many people I imagine in the audience will remember Eric Ambler, Ambler as, a, as a writer of famous uh, mystery and uh, um, diplomatic detective novels. Indeed, if the sordid affair he remembered had been carried out, it could have changed French history dramatically. Cowles recalled that he was finishing his dessert and coffee after the banquet when the maitre d' handed him a place card. On the front was scrawled the name of the wife of the governor general of French Syria, Madame Catru, the wife of, of, of uh, Catru, who was the, the head, the nominal head of the um, the Syrian, uh, of, of the of sort of the ambassador in that sense, under de Gaulle. Uh, to, to Lebanon and Syria. On the back in French was a cryptic message, meet me in the garden immediately after dinner. And once the meal had broken up, Cowles wandered, wandered alone for some time in the darkened grounds of the Residence des Pins. Its gardens were like a small Versailles, he remembered, fearing he had misunderstood. And then finally, Madame Coutreau appeared and they began a halting, difficult conversation, going back and forth between his broken French and her stumbling English. Cowles pieced it together soon enough though. She wanted to get a message to Roosevelt and Churchill and thought Cowles as a top official um, in the war office of war information, this is where Cowles was serving during the war, might serve as her courier. But the message itself took his breath away. She said she knew that the president and prime minister found de Gaulle an impediment to the war effort. If she could arrange for quote, an accident to befall de Gaulle in Beirut, she wanted the two allied leaders to guarantee that her husband would lead the free French into Paris when it was liberated from the Nazis. Cowles was astounded, but she seemed dead serious. He told Wilkie about the conversation on the plane soon after, but his friend wanted no part of it. Mike, the publisher remembered Wilkie saying, you never told me that story. If it ever gets out, I'll say I never heard it. When you get back to Washington, if you want to tell it to Roosevelt, you're on your own. Cowles decided that he had to deliver the message and arranged a meeting with the president when they returned. According to Cowles, Roosevelt made, his tell, tell him, made him tell his story twice and thought it over for a while. He then asked Cowles if he'd be willing to go to London and repeat the story to Churchill if Roosevelt decided it was necessary. Cowles said, of course he would. And then the president told him not to repeat the story to anyone until, until the war was over. He gave the president his word and he never heard a thing about it again. Needless to say, of course, Madame Coutreau failed to carry out any such scheme. Her husband went on to serve in a number of diplomatic posts under de Gaulle, who became the leading figure in post-war French politics and the great symbol of the Third Republic. Now, the story, which comes down to us from only one source, Cowles' memoirs, seems sometimes almost too fanciful to be entirely true. But whatever the gap between his account and what actually happened that night in the garden, the whole affair, no doubt, served to underscore for Wilkie that the allies were more than capable of matching the Lebanese measure for measure in petty, but perhaps deadly squabbling. So I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the flavor of the encounters that he uh, had around the world, particularly in the French context. And happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. We'll give you a chance to drink here, but we do have questions coming in. 
So right. if you're ready to launch right into them, then Absolutely. the first one, yeah. the first one would be um, someone is wondering if you can talk about the 1940 campaign for president a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, as I said at the top, like I see this as the sort of dominant story of Wilkie's life. So how we remember Wilkie and I wanted to sort of destabilize that story a little bit. But um, the 40 campaign is fascinating um, in that Wilkie is the sort of a political unknown, in some sense, an outsider. He's seen as an outsider to politics. In reality, he had been since the 1920s, since his youth, a sort of participant in democratic politics at both the local level in um, in uh, Akron, where he first lived, he's born in Indiana, and his parents and, and family are part of uh, the uh, part of sort of Democratic regulars. Um, and he grows up in a family that's quite involved in, in Democratic politics and in sort of um, populist Democratic politics in many ways. Um, and then he, as I say, he, he lived when he was a young lawyer in Akron, Ohio, and he's part of the Democratic Party there. He was part of the campaign to ratify the League of Nations, the failed campaign to ratify the League of Nations, um, active again in campaigns against the resurgent Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest in those years. And then when he moves to New York City to become a, a lawyer for the utility industry, um, he becomes into politics because he is essentially um, uh, a, a speaking out against the New Deal from within the Democratic Party, but as a representative of the utility industry and speaking out particularly against the Tennessee Valley Authority and FDR's attempts to nationalize parts of the power industry, which would and eventually did um, nationalize some of the holdings in the holding company that Wilkie was at the head of. So he becomes this kind of interesting figure. He's a Democrat, but he's also an anti-New Deal Democrat. And so he becomes very um, attractive to a group of internationalist and anti-isolationist Republicans, internationalist Republicans, we might call them, and liberal Republicans, right, a sort of um, lost breed now in our in this country, um, who were interested in finding someone to run against Roosevelt who would not be an isolationist and who would um, want to see the United States' world, role in the world as quite capacious and would also um, help to figure out how the United States might honorably enter the growing conflict in World War II. This is by this point in 1939. So uh, sometime in late 1939, or early 1940, he switches parties um, and agrees to run under the sponsorship of these, of these internationalist Republicans, many of them grouped around, um, around interests in New York City where he's living at this point. People like uh, Henry Luce of the Time Life um, uh, publishing company, actually the, the publisher of Fortune, Ru uh, Russell Davenport becomes his campaign manager. Um, and there's a whole group of people in and around this world who become supporters of his, a whole network across the country of Wilkie clubs grows up. He eventually makes um, a, a bunch of connections with, with Midwestern Republicans who are internationalists who will back him and on the West Coast as well. Um, he doesn't enter any of the uh, primaries in the 1940 campaign, but he comes to the, the, the convention in 1940 uh, in Philadelphia in June and July, June, July, I'm forgetting now, um, as a kind of dark horse. But he's the force of his personality and his charisma. And I try to tell this story um, in some detail in the beginning of the book to give you a sense for Wilkie as a person um, is this sort of overwhelming. And there is this kind of insurgency within the Republican Party, uh, along with a little um, backroom politicking that secures the nomination during a floor fight on the 1940 convention uh, for Wilkie. Um, and he uh, becomes the nominee uh, somewhat improbably after this after this floor fight, one of the last I think floor fights in American convention history, um, and then uh, goes on to to run against Roosevelt with rather less successful and um, surprising results. Um, Wilkie is less is better at an insurgency within the party than he is in running an organized campaign, um, and loses quite uh, decisively. Um, but he did better than anyone any Republican had done before against Roosevelt, um, while also sort of. Um, agreeing with Roosevelt about a lot of the, the, the questions that are on the, the, the table during this really tumultuous period during the, the, the Blitz and the Battle of Britain um, and, and eventually the advance of the Nazi armies across, um, across Europe and into Paris. Um, and he, he agrees with, with, with Wilkie and sort of protects, sorry, agrees with FDR and sort of protects FDR's right flank, so to speak, um, and ensures that there is a measure of unity um, and after the election, he goes as an emissary to England um, for, for, for Roosevelt and comes back and testifies for uh, Roosevelt's Lend-Lease program, which is one of the main things that helps to get the U.S. into the war. So this is the, the basic story of, of Wilkie's relationship and how he comes to have a national um, prominence. But I think that it's actually this later story of, of, of his trip in one world that gives you a sense of the full development of his imagination about the relationship of the United States to the world and his unconventional and perhaps, perhaps um, neglected, as I've said, view of the world.
Fantastic, thank you. So the next question I have here is, did he have any suggestion for what a post-national governance structure might look like? That's a great question. And Wilkie was an interesting character in that he was not the kind of person who would lay out uh, plans for this sort of thing. Um, he constantly, I think, held that at bay. Um, and I try to get it, I tried to get at this a little bit in this book to give a sense for what it was that he really wanted to see as the structure of, say, the United Nations, right? And all of this, and a lot of my book um, sort of is driving towards the moment where the United Nations is founded. Um, of course, Wilkie dies in October of 1944. He actually dies during the, Dumb the Dumb Dumbarton Oaks Conference, as one of, as, as many in the audience will know, is one of the founding conferences for the, for, in, in which the Allies are putting together the United Nations. But in the years leading up to that, and during his failed second campaign for the presidency in 1944, he's trying to lay out a kind of um, a program for how he will see, um, how he wants his audience, his, his large audience of of American followers to understand the relationship to the world. He never really lays out a plan, right? There are lots and lots of people laying out different kinds of plans. But the thing that he really wants uh, the Americans to, to, to do and to grant and to build into the structure of the United Nations is a more democratic forum for all of the world's nations, right? For all the smaller nations, right? And in this, he's running directly counter to the way that the United Nations is put together um, out, of the, out of Roosevelt's State Department, which um, as we know, creates the structure of the United Nations as it is as it remains today with a Security Council um, uh, uh, composed of what, what Roosevelt thought of as the big four and the General Assembly of, of everybody else, right? And as Roosevelt put it, the General Assembly would get together now and again to blow off steam while the Security Council made all the decisions, right? And had the veto power over anything um, that was proposed. Wilkie really pushed for a, what he called a common council of all nations. And this is what he was writing about in 1943 and 1944. Um, after One World came out and just in the years before his, his death. So that's kind of the way he tried to do it. He wanted, to, in some ways, and I talk about this, he wanted to create a kind of um, a, 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 a sort of undercurrent of public opinion that would get the United States to a more progressive and more democratic shape for international organization. But he was less specific about those details, leaving that to other people. There were many of those circulating in those years. Thanks for okay. that. So the next audience uh, question here, it starts with a comment, which I'll read because it's so lovely. Uh, such a fascinating talk, thank you. Could you please tell us a little more about why Wilkie has disappeared from popular memory and why he's worth remembering today? Sure, thank you for that, that's great. I, 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 I think this has been one of the harder things to pin down. And I spent some time thinking about this in the, um, in the conclusion of the book. Um, you know, and part of this is because a lot of the complexity and um, varied detail and sort of nuanced detail of the political culture of the United States in the years during World War II and just after, right, till 1947 or so, has been lost to what we might call and what many historians have called Cold, Cold War amnesia, right? We have this story about the United States emerging from World War II uh, and becoming a, a global power and needing to become a global power because of, its, because of the mandate and the demand to confront the Soviet Union. Um, and that that was a sort of world historical necessity to do so. Um, and I, I don't really wanna get into the debates around that right now. Um, I think there are convincing um, arguments on both sides of that. Um, and I come down somewhere, um, let's say on the left center of those questions, um, granting that, uh, that, there is, that there is a kind of geopolitical uh, reality in that moment. Um, but what it, that I think has done has really thinned out our sense of the many different alternatives to, to this view that were alive in American politics during these years. Um, those people on the left tend to remember Henry Wallace um, and the Progressive Party campaign of 1948, which was tied, of course, to the Communist Party and which was why it was forgotten for many years because it had been sort of um, uh, airbrushed from our memory, but Wallace and people in the liberal left and on in unions and all offered a kind of progressive take on, on figuring out how to cooperate with the Soviet Union and trying to remake the world. Uh, Wilkie's is a similar vision, although a little bit more to the center of the political spectrum. Um, and he often found himself trying to disagree with Wallace so he wouldn't suffer the same fate as Wallace, which is essentially to be red baited out of public life during the Red Scare. Um, you know, even in the early 
right before Wilkie dies in 1944, some of this is starting to coalesce. People are starting to turn against Wilkie um, for thinking of him as being too friendly to the, to the Soviet Union. He has an interesting set of contretemps with, with, with Stalin over this too, which he, I detail in the book about his meetings with Stalin and his back and forth with Stalin as they tended to like each other personally, but uh, found themselves in, in, in sort of conflicting roles and as Wilkie tried to find his way to a, a cooperation with Stalin. So anyway, I think that what, what this suggests is that people like Wilkie has, the, 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 the position they occupied have sort of been lost um, in the way that we've needed to tell ourselves, I think a very simple story about American power in the Cold War era. Right. And now that we're beyond that, right, well, some of the reckoning with that has been, I think, um, delayed by our needing to reinforce that story through the war on terror. Um, and now we're emerging from that again, and none of those problems have disappeared. But I think it's incumbent upon us to go back and try to understand um, this lost kind of tradition, even if we wouldn't agree with it, right? Even if we'd agree that perhaps Wilkie was naive, as everybody um, from the right to the left said in these years. Um, and that he was too much of an idealist. And I'm sympathetic to that argument, but I think that, again, it's a useful idea to provoke us into new thoughts about our relationship and our geopolitical relationship, uh, particularly in this case, of course, to China, and again, of course, to Russia at our own moment. Uh, how do we strike a balance between figuring out um, a mode of, of, of globalization that takes justice into account, but also allows us to, um, to safeguard American you know, interests abroad? Um, so I think that there's a lot of use of, of, of Wilkie in that sense. Um, and it's useful to try to remember him as an avatar of, a, of, a, of, of something of a road not taken coming out of the worlds of, of, of um, out of the world of World War II. All those W's again, you got yeah. through it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so I see two more questions right now. So we'll, I think we'll have time for both of those. The first one I see is, were Wilkie's observational travels fueled by his perception that a new American approach for self-determination was the way to go, regardless of oil-based priorities and warring tribal and religious conflicts? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that Wilkie is a, if I'm, if I'm understanding what you're asking there, I think that Wilkie is, and I tried to suggest this a little bit in my talk, is it, is it, is, what's interesting about him is he's an ambivalent figure. And in a way, we don't have the full story of what would have happened with Wilkie because he died prematurely. So we don't have a sense for the way that Wilkie's ideas would have played out, right? Um, here he is um, at a moment where he can see that the United States will uh, be the most powerful nation in the world, um, envisions itself in many quarters as needing to essentially take over from the British as the guardian of world order, right? Some courts, particularly amongst American officials, well, this is already um, well underway in 1942, 43, and 44. Um, but also recognizing that the world is much more complicated than that, just as your question suggests, and that that vision of the world kind of narrows it down perhaps too far, and that what is needed is a more expansive vision. Now, we just don't know exactly how Wilkie would have gone. Um, I don't wanna to give too much away, but there's a great story at the end of my book about um, how Wilkie and FDR are working right near the end of Wilkie's life and what would end up being the end of FDR's life too, to um, try a new political co uh, um, collaboration, right? To try to rework the American political system um, for a new liberal kind of party that maybe would have been able to uh, set some new things in motion. Uh, but it was a fraught one, particularly because of their conflicting personalities and their conflicting relationship. And I, you can read about that more in the book. But, you know, it's an open question whether Wilkie would have been able to found some kind of new political reality or whether we would have been more sort of ended up like a more conventional Cold War liberal, right, uh, as many of his allies were in these years, right? I mean, even in 1943 and 44, someone like Henry Luce, who already enunciated a much more triumphalist American vision in his article, The American Century, back in 1941, is sort of peeling away from Wilkie, seeing him as much too idealistic and much too, moving much too much to the left in the sense. Um, and I wonder, had, would Wilkie have followed him? There are already signs that his, um, his early agreements with Stalin in Moscow were sort of falling apart in 1943 and 44, and there was some back channel going on between him and Stalin over, um, over the question of Eastern Europe, right? The great question that would be deviled both the United States and the Soviet Union and lead in many ways to the uh, emergence of the Cold War. So it's an interesting question. We don't know exactly. I think it's 
you know, perhaps less important to ask those kinds of counterfactual questions, which I, I entertain a bit in the book, but also just to see some of the kinds of, again, as I suggested, the, the failures of our imagination to, um, and the things that are left on the table um, that might be renewed in, under new con considerations and new terms today. Great, thank you. Then we have one final question here from another audience member, if we, if you'd like to take it. Absolutely. Um, so what part, if any, did Wilkie's personal life, his relationship with Dita, uh, Dita Baird, play in the campaign? Okay, so I'm not sure who this person is. Who is this? <laughs> I don't know if we're allowed to say. I, I know who it is, but for I don't know if we're you know wanting to preserve it for YouTube and all of our viewers forever. But if you'd like to connect with him personally after, I, I can. I'd like to hear what this thing is talking <laughs> about. Uh, this, well, I can so it. To, let me just say this. Um, Wilkie was a... You know, one of the actually great things about writing about Wilkie is that he is such a charismatic figure. Um, one of the things that I struggle, and one of the things that that means is there's a huge struggle about writing about Wilkie because he's very much a public figure too. We actually know very little about Wilkie's private life. He never kept a diary. He didn't keep a, um, he didn't write extensive letters the way many literary and political figures did. He lived very much sort of off the cuff and, um, and, openly in some extent, but so we have very little sense of the way he operated behind the scenes. A lot of this arrives to us through gossip. Um, and so uh, political gossip particularly. So I tell the story of one of the most famous of his, um, his relationships, right? And Wilkie was known as a serial philanderer essentially in life, right? And that was protected by the ways that powerful men in that time could protect their, their privilege in those years, right? In the sort of misogynistic patriarchy of that time. Um, and that, you know, there was a, essentially what, what amounted to a, a kind of open conspiracy as there was around the, the, the lives of many men, FDR included, around their extramarital affairs. And Wilkie had many apparently. Um, you know, this is, we don't know a lot about this and so many of these things arrive through gossip that it's hard to really talk about whether they're true or not. Um, the one that I do deal with is, is, is one that sort of affects his view of the world and that is his supposed dalliance with Madame Chiang Kai-shek in China, um, which is a fascinating story and um, told again through the, through the reminiscences of a lot of people who have uh, an interest in, in ginning the story up into a fun piece of political gossip. Um, but it really does show uh, why Wilkie was swept up in the drama of the world at large and in becoming, falling under the spell, as many people suggested, of, of someone like Madame Chang is quite fascinating because it gave him a way to explain why he thought, um, in this case, Chinese, the Chinese vision of nationalism and of anti-colonialism was a sort of rising force in the world, even as it uh, occluded his ability to see the corruption inside um, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chang's party, the Guomindang, the Chinese nationalists in those years. Um, so that's another part of the ambivalence of Wilkie there. And I imagine that his relationships with many people, um, I'm happy to, to talk further with anyone uh, offline about that. Um, I'm happy to learn about more of these things, although I think it's, you know, it's hard to, to, hard to know exactly what the truth of some of these things are. Um, colors the way we think of Wilkie, all right? His charisma is both makes him an attractive political figure and also makes him into somebody that's, um, Sometimes hard to, pin, hard, hard to pin down what's really going on behind the scenes in these situations. Great, thank you. Yes, and this audience member would like to connect with you personally, and I will arrange that. So I promise yeah. that you'll you'll have your chance to catch up about Absolutely. the points. My, my email is easy to find at Brown, and I can just go to my website, samuelzip.com, and it's all right there. Yeah, speaking of that, I wanted to drop the, the link for the book in the chat again here. Um, so it the book does ship to the US, UK, wherever you might be in Europe. Um, so you can go ahead and click on that. It's just the direct link to the Harvard University Press website where the idealist is available. Um, we actually did get one other question coming in. I think we have time if you're, you're game for it. All right. Um, so the final question then will be, how did he acquire such an idealistic viewpoint on geopolitics at a time when it was not the norm? Yeah, I mean, I think this is is sort of really thanks for this. It's 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 linked in a way to the question I just said before. I just uh, talked about before, which is about this question of Wilkie's public and private lives, um, which are so hard to disentangle. One of his earlier biographies said we never really see Wilkie in private. It's very hard to know how what resources he drew on to um, to develop this sense of idealism. From what I was able to tell, and this is mostly from 
you know, from, from accounts of his earlier life, right? There are several earlier uh, Wilkie biographies that take in the, st the, the stretch of his whole, whole life. Um, I think that a lot of this had to do with his family. Um, he grew up in a, in, a, in a very sort of gregarious and open family. He had what I think it was five brothers and sisters, six maybe, I'm forgetting now. He's right in the middle. Um, his father was a lawyer and his, both his parents were lawyers. Um, and this is a, you know, a turn of the century, Indiana, um, small cities and a small city called Elwood in Indiana that, 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 um, you know, the legend was that his mother was the first woman appointed to the Indiana bar. She was a sort of notorious, um, or, or, or sort of famous, um, kind of gregarious, um, social and, po uh, professional political person in, in, in Indiana in those years. And his father was well known as a kind of labor lawyer, progressive labor lawyer. So they oversaw this house that was just kind of overflowing with books and ideas and um, discussion and talk. They were part of the Chautauqua movement at, at the turn of the century, which hosted all kinds of speakers and people. And they, they were quite close with particular people in the Democratic Party. They hosted people like William Jennings Bryan in their house. Um, and so he grew up in this world where he was expected to be somebody who looked um, outward at the world and who was supposed to take an active role in that world. He had a whole host of fascinating jobs when he was a kid working in different places, much unlike, uh, you know, sort of an old school sort of Tom Sawyer like boyhood, right? He worked out West um, in logging camps or mine, farmers uh, farms and things like that when he was a boy. Um, and he just had this kind of capacious outlook on the world, one of which was also sort of bound up in ideas about the American frontier, which I think also gave him this sort of ambivalent sense of America's mission and destiny in the world that I think, um, you know, gives us a sense of this ambivalent world, right? Well, both his idealism and, and the sense that he shared of a, a kind of um, American mission that has both a, a bright and I think a, a dark side in his years. Um, and I think he was smart enough and, 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 you know, and people have described his, his his personality is sort of plastic, right? Somebody who was really flexible and could take on things that he learned quickly, right? He was smart enough over the course of his life to adapt that, right? To undo some of the assumptions that he had had about um, racial hierarchy and things like that when he came into contact with new people, right? Here's a white person um, high up in, in, in social circles in the United States in these years, right? And, you know, a corporation lawyer in New York City, who's one of his closest friends is Walter White, the head of the NAACP by the mid forties, right? Someone who was not afraid to make, make friends in all kinds of different uh, lives. But at the same time, he was someone who had this kind of interest in the old South and the romance of the old South, right? Which you would think would be things that would be odds with one another. And it's possible that the, the civil rights ideals that he came, began to undo some of his romance in that. But you see him adopting all kinds of different personas. And one and I think they were all yoked together by this idealism, some of which must have let, um, led him to kind of uh, soft pedal or, or cover over some of the contradictions in some of these ideas. So I, that's the way I see it. I think Wilkie's kind of a fascinating figure because it's hard to get old on him. And then uh, you, you can place him in all these public debates that he eagerly engages in um, to the making of great controversy and interest. Um, and it's stories that we've had have sort of been uh, been lost in, in American history and, and that I, I hope to have brought back with this book. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to give this presentation and to answer all of our wonderful audience questions so thoroughly. It's really been a pleasure to host you, Sandy. Yeah, thank you so much and everybody for coming. I, I've been glad to talk with you. I'm, I'm so sorry that we can't have done it in person. So I've got to actually see everybody's faces, but uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah, we do hope to see you in Paris at some point. You have a standing invitation. So the next uh -huh. time you're able to make it over, we'd love to host you again. That would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, now I'll just close with a few more words about the library. So bear with me if you can. I know we're just hitting 8.30 here. Um, again, thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. It was lovely to see your engagement. It's always amazing if we can, you know, have great audience questions and we had a few really, really good ones tonight. So thank you for making this event even more special. Um, we hope to see you again soon through any other program that might interest you. I invite you to check out our programs calendar. Everything is posted through the month of March. So you can go ahead and check that out and sign up for any events that might be tempting for you. Um, I also wanted to remind you that the American Library is a nonprofit and we do welcome donations. Um, typically in person, we welcome about 10 euros per person per event. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, you can go ahead and donate through the link that I provided um, in the email that went out with the Zoom link. It's just the, the link above that one. So 
Thank you for your support in advance if that's something that you're interested in doing. And thank you also to our sponsor for Evenings with an Author, uh, Grow at Annenberg. So thank you again, Dr. Samuel Zip. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. You're already on mute. All right. Well, take care, everybody, and uh, see you next time. Good night.